Welcome to Python Basics, reading and writing files. Files are abundant in the modern world. They are the medium in which data is digitally stored and transferred. Chances are you've opened dozens if not hundreds of files just today. In this course, you'll learn how to move data back and forth between your Python programs and external software by reading and writing files. More specifically, you'll be working with human-readable text files which contain plain text as opposed to binary data meant for machines to process. Along the way, you'll practice reading and writing data stored in the CSV file format, which stands for comma-separated values. It's one of the most widely supported file formats for transferring tabular data, such as spreadsheets or database tables. Data scientists and machine learning engineers often choose CSV to store and exchange datasets too. The sample file that you can see here is a valid CSV file representing fake home budget expenses that you'll use later in this course. You can download it by expanding the supporting materials dropdown just below this video and choosing the sample code archive. Real Python has several great tutorials and video courses dedicated to handling CSV files in Python, so feel free to check them out later. Before you get started, here's a quick overview of the topics that you're going to cover over the next few lessons. First, you'll get a general idea about the differences between text and binary files, which are the two primary types of files on any computer. However, in this course, you'll mostly focus on reading and writing text files in Python. Reading text files requires you to choose the right character encoding and line endings, or else you may end up with garbled text. You'll also take a closer look at the file object in Python, which represents the file on disk and provides methods for reading and writing data to it. Then you'll learn about several file modes which can restrict the available operations on the same file depending on how you want to use it. You'll open the file in Python using a few different approaches and you'll learn about some useful idioms to avoid problems when reading and writing files. Finally, you'll take advantage of the standard library's CSV module to manipulate tabular data that you might have exported from a spreadsheet program. Note that this video course is a part of the Python Basics learning path based on the book with the same title, which you can get at the link below. While this course is reasonably self-contained, you'll benefit from watching an earlier course entitled File System Operations or reading the corresponding chapter in the Python Basics book, which provides the foundation for the material covered in this course. You'll find the links to all these resources in the description below. Like all the other courses in this Python Basic series, this one also uses IDLE to demonstrate code snippets. IDLE, or the Integrated Development and Learning Environment, should already come with your Python distribution, so there's no extra step for you to take. You can run it by typing IDLE at your terminal prompt, or by finding the IDLE icon in your operating system applications. If you're unsure what IDLE is, check out an earlier course in the Python Basics series entitled Setting Up Python. You can also watch a separate Starting with Python IDLE video course, which goes into even more detail. This video course is made up of the following lessons. You can stop the video at this point and take some time to become acquainted with the table of contents before moving on. All right, it's time to crack open your first file in Python and see what's inside. In this lesson, you'll learn about two different ways to open a file in Python and why you need to close the file afterward. You'll also look at some good practices for working with files in Python. If you'd like to try out the code snippets interactively while following this video, then go ahead and start idle now. The first thing you need to do when you want to either read or write data to a file in Python is to open that file by specifying the corresponding path in the file system. The quickest way to open a file for reading in Python is by calling the built-in open function, which at the very minimum expects a string with a file name as the first argument. Python will try to find this file in the current working directory, which is where your script is currently running or where you started the interactive Python interpreter. 
When you open Idle by clicking an icon in your operating system's menu, then it might run in the location where you installed Python. If your file is located elsewhere, then you can optionally provide a path relative to the current directory or an absolute path that starts at the root of your file system. The path may look slightly different depending on which operating system you're on. For example, Windows uses backslash characters instead of forward slashes as path separators. It also comes with multiple file system routes associated with hard drives on your computer. If the file can't be found in the specified location, you'll immediately get an error. Otherwise, Open returns an object representation of the file, which you'll use to interact with the corresponding data stored on disk. This object is called a file object or sometimes a file-like object. By default, Python opens files in reading mode, denoted with a letter R, and uses the character encoding specific to your operating system. You'll learn when and how to change those later. It's a good idea to assign the file object returned by open to a variable so that you can call one of its methods, so let's go ahead and do that. When you're done working with a file in Python, you should always close it by calling the close method, which tells the operating system that it can safely reclaim the associated resources. In some cases, failing to do so may lead to memory leaks, prevent other programs from accessing your file until you exit Python, or worse, it could irreversibly corrupt your data by not flushing the internal buffer in time. It's worth noting that once you close a file, you can no longer read or write data to it. To check the state of your file object, you can inspect its closed attribute. In this case, the file is already closed. It's important to assume that your program could crash at any moment for whatever reason, which can sometimes be completely beyond your control. To ensure that files are eventually closed, even in case of unexpected errors, you can take advantage of a common idiom that relies on the try finally close. You can start by declaring your file variable and assigning an initial value of none to it. Then you start a try block in which you make an attempt to open the file. Finally, when you're done processing the file, if the corresponding file object indicated by your file variable exists in memory, then you can close the corresponding file. The if statement is necessary here in case the call to the open function fails, leaving your file variable undefined. The finally close will run unconditionally regardless of potential exceptions. Now, that's a bit of a mouthful, don't you think? Fortunately, because this is such a common idiom, Python provides a more convenient shortcut called the context manager, which can automatically clean up resources for you. In this case, it would call the close method on the file object, even if there was an exception. Context managers rely on Python's width statement. To take advantage of a file object's context manager, just type the width keyword before calling open and intercept the returned file object using the s keyword, followed by your variable name. This is great because you no longer have to remember to close the file yourself and the code looks much more readable too. From now on, when you think about reading or writing files in Python, regardless of how you open them, you should always use the width statement to ensure that your files are properly closed. Calling open has been the standard way of working with files in Python for a really long time. However, this built-in function has one drawback. It doesn't provide any abstraction to account for the differences across the operating systems in terms of handling their file paths. You must provide a string to open, which Python will then try to interpret as a file path. Unfortunately, that might fail, for example, due to the use of the wrong path separator character. To address this problem and make your code more portable, Python 3.4 introduced a new way of opening files through the path object from the new pathlib module. If you haven't watched the previous video course in this Python basic series entitled File System Operations, then now would be a good time. That course goes into much more detail about the Pathlab module.
The downside of using Pathlab is that you now have to import an additional module. However, once you've imported the path object, you can construct paths with the help of the forward slash operator without worrying about the technical details of a particular file system. You can mix path objects with Python strings as long as one of the values is an instance of the path class. Depending on your operating system, you may get a concrete Windows path or POSIX path object, which provides a familiar open method. To access that method, let's first assign your path to a variable. Notice that path is not the same as the file. It's possible that the corresponding file doesn't even exist on your computer at the moment. To try and open that file, you should use the with statement as before when calling path open and intercept the resulting file object. That looks almost exactly the same as calling the built-in open function, except that the path open method doesn't expect a string as an argument anymore because it already knows your path from the previous line. This is the modern and recommended way of opening files in Python projects. However, it doesn't render the built-in open function completely obsolete as you don't always need to take advantage of all the features that Pathlib has to offer. Sometimes, especially when you quickly test things out, you don't care about portability. Opening files the old school way will require fewer keystrokes while using the Padlet module would be overkill. For this reason, you'll see a mix of both techniques used throughout this course, depending on which one is more convenient at the given moment. Similarly, while the width statement is almost always the way to go, there will be a few times in this course when it's easier to show what's happening under the surface without using one. The width statement executes some convenience code, making the individual steps invisible, which doesn't help explain what's really going on. Okay, let's quickly recap what you've just learned. To read or write data to a file in Python, you need to open that file, for example, by calling the built-in open function, which expects a suitable file name as an argument. The function returns a file-like object that you'll usually save in a variable. Instead of the file name, you can specify a path relative to the current working directory, or you may specify an absolute path that starts at the root of your file system. This can pinpoint a given file unambiguously, but at the same time, it's the least portable way of specifying a file path because of the differences in the file systems across the platforms. When you're done working with a file object, you must close it by calling the close method to avoid the data loss or other potential problems. Once closed, a file object is no longer usable in Python. If you'd like to learn more about why it's important to close files in Python and what could happen if you don't, then check out this Q&A tutorial which dives into this very topic. To ensure that files always get closed, even if an error occurs, you can use the try finally clause which will run the finally block unconditionally. However, Python also has an equivalent with statement which uses the file object's context manager to automatically close the file after executing the wet block regardless of errors. Therefore, it's recommended to use the wet statement whenever you work with files. Finally, instead of calling the built-in open function, you can create a more versatile path object imported from the pathlib module and call its open method, which works similarly. However, a path object is a more modern tool for working with files and directories which can be especially helpful in dealing with cross-platform paths. Next up, you're going to take a closer look at understanding the text and binary files. In this lesson, you're going to understand what it means to open a file in text or binary mode in Python. Broadly speaking, Files on our computer can contain either human-readable text or binary data designed for machines, even when they both represent the same piece of information. Some examples of text files might include your Python source files, HTML files, or CSV data files exported from a spreadsheet program. 
To give you an idea of binary files, think of audio and video data, images or executable machine code, none of which are text. These can be sound waves, pixels or instructions for a computer processor. By the way, don't confuse plain text files with rich text format documents such as Microsoft Word, LibreOffice Writer or Google Docs. These can store additional text formatting data like font size, text alignment, bullet points, and sometimes visual elements like tables, charts, and so on. Those elements don't usually have a meaningful representation in text as they take the form of numbers meant to be read by a computer program that knows how to display them. So even though what you're looking at consists of text primarily, it is not considered a plain text file. Here over on the left, you have a sample text file stored in the comma-separated value format. It contains some personal expenses. When you import that file into the Office software of your choice and save it as a spreadsheet, then you'll end up with a binary file whose content under the surface might look similar to the one on the right. These are numbers without any meaningful textual representation. When you try to open such a binary file in a text editor, then a few things can happen. First, your editor might recognize it's dealing with a binary file and it'll just refuse to open it. Alternatively, it may try to map each number into a character, which will almost certainly result in a bunch of gibberish that doesn't make any sense. Finally, your editor can display the values of the individual bytes, for example, using hexadecimal digits like here on the slide. Note that from a technical point of view, there's no real difference between text and binary files as they both consist of bytes representing some numbers. It's only a matter of how you and your software decide to interpret these numbers, which to some extent is arbitrary. However, this also means that you can get things wrong in binary mode unless you know the underlying file structure. Many commercial programs deliberately use proprietary binary file formats without disclosing their internal structure to lock you into a particular product. As a result, it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to open your files using unofficial software unless someone successfully reverse engineers the file format at hand. If you zoom in on the word cache, for example, in the text file on the left, then you won't see any numbers just yet. It's because your text editor conveniently replaces each number it finds in the file with a corresponding character before showing it to you. However, you can reveal the file's actual byte values using a command line tool like Hexdump. As the name implies, the tool dumps hexadecimal values of bytes in the given file. So, for example, the first byte in the file has a hex value of 63 or 99 in decimal, which is the numeric code for the lowercase letter C in the ASCII encoding. ASCII stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange, and is by far the most common character encoding system used for English text documents. It's also one of the oldest and not the only character encoding in use today. You'll learn more about character encodings in the next lesson. Note that you can use Python's ORT and CHR built-in functions to double-check if this number-character relationship holds. ORT returns the character's ordinal value, while CHR returns the corresponding character. When you open a file in Python, either with the built-in open function or the path open method, you have the choice of specifying whether you want Python to treat the file as a stream of human-readable characters or generic bytes. In other words, you can read the same file using either text or binary mode in Python. In the text mode, Python will automatically take care of translating the sequences of bytes into meaningful characters wrapped in Python string objects, and it will let you read the text line by line, which, although possible, doesn't make much sense in binary mode. On the other hand, binary mode lets you read the raw bytes as integers from the file without any translation. This can be convenient if you want to manipulate the bytes directly, for example, when processing an image. Now, how do you specify which mode to open the file in Python? By default, if you don't pass any arguments to open, Python will open the file in text mode for reading. You can verify the file mode by inspecting the returned file object's mode attribute, and you can find out if it's readable or writable by calling the corresponding methods. 
When you execute this code, you'll see the letter R, which stands for readable, appear in the output. It is the default value for the mode argument, which you can set explicitly when calling the open method or function. When the mode attribute doesn't say otherwise, the file will be opened in text mode. Although text mode is assumed implicitly, you can include the extra letter code T to indicate the text mode more explicitly if you really want to. However, because the letter T is implied, you can leave it out and almost never use it again in practice. To open your file in binary mode, you must replace the letter T with the letter B, as in the word Barbara. Note that you can't have both text and binary modes set at the same time because they're mutually exclusive. You'll learn about a few other letter codes for the available file modes in Python and when to use them in an upcoming lesson. Also, from now on, you'll only be considering text files in this course, so you won't have to worry about the binary mode anymore. Now, you might face a few problems that are only relevant to opening files in text mode. They'll manifest themselves when you rely on the defaults provided by Python. These default values can be different for different people depending on their operating system. Specifically, the two parameters that can cause problems are the files character encoding and line ending. Python will make a best guess when you don't specify them, but it's generally recommended to set them by hand. Since you understand the concept of text files a little better, you're ready to dive into character encoding and learn why and how to specify one in Python. In this lesson, you'll learn how to specify the character encoding of a text file in Python so that you can correctly read the file contents. Decoding row bytes into characters and the other way around requires that you choose and agree on some encoding scheme, which is usually known as character encoding. You can experiment with this concept by running a few lines of code in idle. Start by declaring a string of characters like cache, which is the word that you saw in the previous lesson. You can then encode the string into the corresponding bytes. What comes back is a bytes object literal, which looks quite like a regular string, except that it starts with a lowercase letter b. However, it's actually a concealed sequence of numeric bytes that you can reveal by turning them into a list, for example. If you look closely, these are exactly the same numeric ASCII codes that you saw earlier. Note that you can reverse the process by creating a new instance of the bytes object, passing the list of integers, and calling the code on it. Don't worry about the technical details though, this is only to illustrate the idea behind encoding characters into bytes and decoding them back into characters. Python does this automatically for you whenever you open a file in text mode, so this happens seamlessly in the background. Unfortunately, things can get more complicated when you stumble on some funky characters that aren't defined in the original ASCII encoding table. These could be letters with diacritic marks or symbols from non-Latin alphabets. ASCII was designed for the English language after all. Let's say you wanted to decode the following sequence of bytes. I'm going to change the last two and append one more. This produces the word cafe with an accent. Notice that although the word only has four characters, it was encoded using five bytes, and that's because of the last character, which doesn't have a corresponding ASCII code. How was it then possible for Python to decode it, you may ask? Well, when you don't request any particular character encoding yourself, then Python silently falls back to your operating system's default character encoding. In my case, that default encoding happens to be UDF8, which is a superset of ASCII, so it's fully backwards compatible, but at the same time, it extends ASCII with a much wider range of characters. Note that this doesn't mean it'll be the same for you. Your operating system may be using a completely different character encoding. This is a problem because if you test your code on, say, macOS and it works, then it doesn't necessarily mean it'll work elsewhere. It's one of the reasons why you should always specify what character encoding to use. 
When in doubt, just request UTF-8, which has become the widespread standard across the world. You can do this by passing a string with the encoding's name to the relevant method. When you try something else, like ASCII, then you're going to have a problem because one of the bytes doesn't correspond to any known ASCII code. Similarly, when you specify a character encoding that can't represent one of the letters from your text, Python won't be able to encode a string into bytes. These problems will also affect your text files, so to address them, both the built-in open function, as well as its path open counterpart, expose the encoding attribute. When you open a file in text mode, which is the default mode, you must tell Python which character encoding the file was written with. That's because different character encodings will represent the same text differently. If you provide an incorrect encoding like here, then you'll most likely end up with a familiar error or, in the best case scenario, some nonsensical output. In general, you have to know the encoding of a text file that you're about to open for reading. If you're unsure, then there are libraries like Cardet that can help you with that by trying to guess the encoding. However, there's no guarantee they'll succeed at all. If you'd like to get a complete list of character encodings that your Python version supports, then import the aliases dictionary from encodings aliases and get all of its values. These are the encoding names that you can use when you open a file in Python. In early computing, people adopted dozens of character encodings to encompass the unique needs of different spoken languages. Because of the limited disk space at the time, each encoding assigned different characters to the same byte value, making those encodings mostly incompatible with each other. For example, the byte value 225 could represent any of the letters depicted in the first row of the table on the slide and even more. Apart from that, once you had chosen a given character encoding for your text, you could only represent characters belonging to a few similar alphabets. So if you wanted to write a piece of text that included Arabic, Greek, and Korean all at the same time, then you'd be out of luck. It just wasn't possible to fit all these different characters on a single encoding. Fortunately, this problem is a thing of the past thanks to the advent of Unicode, which is a single, standardized, and universal numeric representation of all characters from any spoken language. It even specifies emoji symbols. In Unicode, each character is given a unique number called a code point that can't be confused with any other character. However, because this standard defines almost 150,000 characters, there's no single font that could possibly display them all. There's a whole family of specific Unicode to byte encodings that may use a different number of bytes per character depending on your primary language. For example, if your text is mostly English with occasional foreign language asides or citations, then you may want to allocate fewer bytes for Latin letters because they appear most frequently. In this case, you can use UTF-8, which is backward compatible with ASCII by using only 8 bits or a single byte per character. That being said, UTF-8 may sometimes require as many as 4 bytes to encode an exotic character, like an emoji symbol. So it's a form of variable length encoding. Conversely, other popular Unicode encodings always use multiple bytes, which may be preferable when your text predominantly consists of non-English characters. These days, UDF-8 is arguably the most widely used character encoding on the planet. Software programs, including Python, adopt it as standard. This encoding remains backward compatible with ASCII because the first 128 characters have essentially identical byte values. At the same time, it supports multiple languages, uses the previously mentioned compact representation, and was designed to be internet-friendly. 
All in all, UTF-8 should become the default choice for your applications because you can't go wrong with it. Even if you don't think you'll ever need to use characters other than English letters, embracing Unicode early on is still a good idea because you may eventually want to offer your content in other languages or the content may be user-generated, in which case you'll need to support a wide range of characters anyway. As a rule of thumb, always explicitly specify the character encoding of a text file that you open in Python and make sure that it actually matches the encoding that the file was written with. If you're creating a new file yourself, then stick with UTF-8, which is the most suitable encoding in most cases. Not specifying any character encoding when you open a text file is a common mistake which some tools, and sometimes even Python itself, will warn you about. One of the most extreme but also very real examples of this problem can actually prevent you from installing a Python library. This is because many build tools will try to open the readme file of a package as part of the installation procedure. If they fail to decode the characters in that file because of the wrong character encoding, then you'll only be able to install the library on some operating systems, but not others. Character encoding is not the only thing you should keep in mind when you open a file in Python. Another thing that you may sometimes need to consider when working with text files in Python is the line-ending character, which you'll learn about in the next lesson.